My name is Brad Doubling, and I'm uh, joined in this presentation by Eric Siebenick, who's a colleague of mine in Arizona. And um, this is just a summary of my background, which has already been reviewed. So I work as a consultant for Newbie 3, which is a company that's developed this device. And Eric is a specialist in clinical trials and quality improvement. And this shows the executive medical team who uh, have been advising the company. The, uh, Dr. Cameron Chowdhury is one of the executive medical directors. He's a uh, board certified rheumatologist. Jim Houston is a board certified pain doctor and anesthesiologist. John Rosa is a chiropractor and an expert in opioid use disorder and wellness. Atish Zafar is a general internist and informaticist and uh, entrepreneur. Uh, there's myself in the center. Wes Wong is a neurologist and uh, board certified in neurology. Um, I'm board certified in medicine and infectious disease. Angelo Falcone is an e ER specialist and board certified in ER and uh, directs a national network of um, emergency rooms and providers. Brian Barber is a uh, general internist who um, oversees uh, urgent care at the VA hospital. And um, I've introduced you to Eric. So we have a strong team in uh, advising the company. So just a little background there's considerable research evidence that shows that the symptoms of chronic pain, anxiety, depression, and sleeplessness, or any combination of those are among the most prevalent of any symptoms in the outpatient setting. And they're particularly prevalent in people who have chronic medical conditions, particularly things like inflammatory arthritis, fibromyalgia, anxiety disorders, depression, chronic pain, conditions and sleep disorders. So these patients have a need for innovative treatment approaches to address these symptoms as they often occur simultaneously and up to half of outpatients may be bothered by one or more of these problems, sometimes even higher prevalences depending on the clinic. So chronic pain is the most prevalent of all symptoms. It, it, uh, Prevalence worldwide is about 20.4% in outpatient settings. For those over age 65, it's 30.4%. The lifetime prevalence of anxiety is about 7.3% and ranges from five to 10.4 in different cultures. The global prevalence of major depressive disorder is 4.7 in some studies up to 10%. And insomnia is another global public health issue uh, affecting up to 30 to 35% of the populations. So you can see that these are very prevalent problems. And not only that, they occur together. So they're very difficult to treat and account for a, a lot of what doctors see in outpatient settings. So these um, symptoms tend to be very varied and one of the common denominators in patients with these issues are these symptoms. Over time, without effective treatment, they can become chronic and very difficult to mitigate. And they may lead to a dependency on medicines that become less and less effective as they're used. There have been a variety of different types of treatments that have been tried, uh, but there are problems with it, which we'll go into. So, on the left, you can see um, probably one of the most common causes is an adverse event or an injury that can result in chronic symptoms. A number of diseases or disorders, as we just summarized, are associated with these four symptoms. And then external stress or stressful situations can um, lead to these problems, particularly chronic anxiety, depression, and sleeplessness and COVID has uh, certainly increased the prevalence of these problems. So um, in treating these common symptoms, there actually have been relatively few 
safe and effective ways to treat these symptoms. Some of the most uh, common forms of treatment are pharmaceutical. They are um, often sometimes invasive and they're typically developed and delivered in short sessions, which give uh, little or no long-term relief. And one of the challenging things is that many pharmaceuticals can become less effective over time. And some like narcotics lead to unhealthy dependence or drug addiction. So historically, they, they can be delivered through injections, uh, implanted devices, through surgery, uh, pain medications. And uh, these patients also often use and treat themselves with alcohol or illegal drugs, which can exacerbate the problem. In the United States, there's been a marked rise in prescription drug use, roughly um, 20 to 29% of patients who are prescribed opioids for chronic pain misuse them. And you can see that prescription drug use has increased markedly over the last 20 years in the United States. So this slide shows the frequency of national uh, drug overdose deaths involving any opioid from 1999, it was less than 10,000. And in the most recent year for which we have full data, it's around 50,000 deaths related to opioid use disorders. So imagine a world without those, we think that this uh, device has the potential to help treat and um, eliminate many opioid use disorders. So if it, from 1999 to 2019, about 500,000 people died from an overdose involving any opioid, both prescription and illicit. So the ways that this, if this isn't solved, um, people have tried a variety of strategies, as I mentioned, traditional pharmaceutical intervention, meditation, mindfulness, yoga, Tai Chi. There have been a number of untested and unapproved non-pharmaceutical supplements, auricular acupuncture or massage of the ear, battlefield acupuncture have been shown to be effective, actually in a very similar mechanism to what works with this device and neuromodulation. So modifying the neuro symptoms and system. The slide shows uh, the different types of neuromodulation technologies that are available. There are obviously pharmaceutical neuromodulation, uh, TENS devices, which exert a electrical stimulus directly uh, uh, to the area of pain, uh, which is been typically used in the lower back, but it's been increasingly used in the legs and lower extremities. Deep brain simulation is another approach, but it requires a, a invasive surgery to place the electrodes. Transcranial magnetic simulation has, is starting to be tested, but it's uh, very expensive and obviously not something that you can um, rely on for very long periods of time without Kind of interrupting your life a bit. The spinal cord stimulation has also been used for chronic uh, low back pain or mid thoracic pain, but it requires an invasive uh, procedure. And then the this latest technology is the that made by this company NuV3 that causes uh, neuromodulation. And you can see it's a, a small device that's worn behind the ear and connects through electrodes to the ear. So this device is uh, referred to as NUV3. It's miniaturized and wearable. It's um, patented and re has received uh, several awards in national and international technology um, meetings. It's miniaturized. It, delivers neuromodulation for short and long-term relief of co common symptoms through some cutting edge technology, both non-invasively and non-pharmaceutically. And it um, has some advantages to other technologies in that it, uh, we have data that it's effective and 
uh, can be worn uh, throughout the, the day, uh, actually multiple days in a row. And it's easy to apply and relatively simple to use. It's non-invasive and uh, comfortable and uh, light to wear. So this is a close-up of the device. Um, it's been engineered through over 700 different uh, forms over the last 10 years to be very light and relatively um, easy to wear. It's made from a uh, biocompatible silicone material that connects to the ear and uh, sits right behind it, kind of like a hearing aid. And it's activated through pulling this tab and a variety of different adjustments have been developed to help um, adjust to the different patient's ears. So what it does is it does uh, cranial electrical stimulation. So that's essentially stimulating the cranial nerves through the auricular area. And NUV3 does this non-invasively and non-pharmaceutically. It does it through a, a rapid set of electrical stimuli that aren't, aren't even sensed. And we know that one of the mechanisms is that it helps, uh, it produces meta-encephalins. And these are um, key in uh, managing the symptoms. And it also results in vasodilatation and uh, lower blood pressure and improving blood flow and reducing inflammation. So those are some of the core benefits that have been seen. So this micro signal that's produced by the NUV3 device is delivered through the cranial nerves through a pulse stimulation, as I mentioned, and it travels through the cranial nerves to the brain, the brainstem and the hypothalamus. And it accesses the autonomic nervous system at a strength and frequency that creates minimal resistance. So these cranial nerves, particularly the vagus nerve, the trigeminal and the glossopharyngeal are accessed non-invasively by the device, which is worn on the ear. And because it can be worn 24 seven, treatment is provided uninterrupted over the length of the treatment program, often eight to 12 weeks. And it's targeted as I mentioned at these four symptoms, chronic pain, anxiety, depression, and sleeplessness. So this slide shows that uh, cytokines are signaled mediated by alpha-7 and acetylcholine receptors in the cytokine producing cells. And the cholinergic signals are delivered from the vagus nerve and they inhibit the release of TNF, IL-1, and HMGB1 and other cytokines. When people experience stress, they in the brain start to, they produce uh, monoamines, excited toxicity and trophic factors get decreased. And that has an um, impact on NF and CRH. And with vagal stimulation, it can cause um, improvement of the immune system, stimulation of the uh, adrenal gland, pr production of cortisol, and causes a feedback loop to reduce stress. Also within the cholinergic and inflammatory pathway, there is a cycle where um, different stressors like pathogens, ischemia, injury, or cytokines can, through the afferent vagus nerve, stimulate the brain. There's this cholinergic brain network that we've already reviewed that can then have a impact on the efferent vagus nerve, causes the heart to uh, experience less stress and um, helps stimulate the inflammatory system including macrophages to be more active and uh, cause decreased inflammation and uh, tissue recovery and increased blood flow. So we've done an, uh, some, a number of clinical studies with the device. Um, we've been outlining, and I'll talk about that in just a second. We have developed uh, several new V3 treatment programs for different populations that we think are really primed to benefit from the device. 
And we also are um, studying the use of a device for heart rate variability tracking, which can be a feedback about the level of um, activation of the autonomic nervous system and give us a, something objective to measure in terms of the patient's response. So in our clinical trials, we conducted an open label trial of 16 severe diabetic neuropathy patients and participants completed standardized assessments and a weekly pain scale. The patients typically had three or more of these four clinical symptoms of their severe diabetic neuropathy and um, often had very severe limitations in activity because of their pain. They had a, at least a five out of 10 uh, pain level at baseline before treatment with 10 being the most severe possible. And within about eight weeks of starting treatment, participants had a nearly one half reduction in chronic pain that was sustained through 32 weeks of follow-up after these eight weeks of treatment. And among those with chronic pain, anxiety was present in over 60% with at least moderate levels. After eight weeks of treatment, patients had a 73% reduction in anxiety and we saw a 60% mean reduction in depression after five, after eight weeks. Sleeplessness on average was rated a five out of 10 in this group, and most of whom had moderate inability to maintain a good night's rest. And treatment reduced this by about three quarters, 72%. Uh, importantly, there was significant improvement of quality of life in uh, all the patients. This improvement peaked um, at about week five, and there was little change from weeks five to eight. And we saw a remarkable uh, satisfaction and daily activity improvement in patients who used the new V3 device. In fact, some of the diabetic patients were able to uh, reduce their diabetic medications and pain medications dramatically. Uh, they reported being able to do many activities they hadn't been able to do before, like gardening, spending time with their children, shopping with their spouse, hiking, working, caring for the sick relatives. And we found no significant side effects, frustration, discomfort, and many patients were able to stop some or all of their medications, as I mentioned. So the device seems to be safe and effective. So based on pilot results, we are planning three stages for further evaluation and are uh, looking for um, funding right now we um, have developed some programs that uh, make use of the heart rate variability uh, device, as I've mentioned, and we are uh, looking to fund, obtain funding for cl comprehensive clinical trials for a variety of health conditions um, to look at the safety, effectiveness, ease of use, and to determine duration of effect after an initial treatment course. So this device seems to help uh, people return to normal lives and seems to be effective. And we think it represents the future of neuromodulation. Thank you.